You are listening to the Lawyer Stories Podcast with host Benny Gold. Lawyer Stories was founded in July 2017 and is an expanding global network of lawyers and law students sharing their personal journeys to the noble profession of the practice of law. Join us on this podcast as we dig deeper into these stories and hear from lawyers and law students from around the world in all areas of the legal profession. Here at Lawyer Stories, we believe that every lawyer has a story. What's yours? Welcome to the Lawyer Stories podcast with Benny Gold. Uh, Today we welcome in Tyra Hughley Smith, principal attorney and founder of Hughley Smith Law PC in Los Angeles, California, uh, owner of a boutique business protection and IP law firm. How are you? I'm great. How are you? Good, good. Nice, nice to see you. Thanks for joining us. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Yeah, of course. I'm, I'm excited to talk about your story because it is very interesting to me, um, jur- from journalist to photographer to writer to lawyer. And I think it'll be very interesting um, to a lot of other people practicing law. Um, so what's going on out there? Like, I know, you know, you're in Vegas visiting some family right now. You're not in your traditional office space, but like what's what's popping over there with COVID in like LA and, uh, you know, Vegas, is it is it getting bad or is it coming back down or what? You know, uh, I, in LA, it's definitely, I think everywhere it's picking up right now. Um, LA has been taking it pretty seriously with, you know, requiring vaccination to dine in and in certain places like gyms and entertainment venues. So it's been a little bit better, I think, but I think it's just picking up everywhere, honestly. Yeah, I, I agree. That's what's happening here in central Massachusetts where I am. So it's, uh, it's unfortunate. Yeah. Um, so we look forward to featuring you on Lawyer Stories, Lawyer underscore Stories on Instagram. And we also have a community on Facebook. Um, we're looking forward to getting you up in the feed. I know we haven't done that yet. Um, but to begin... Uh, you, your story is basically also told on, on LinkedIn. So check out uh, Tyra on LinkedIn. Um, and it indicates that you, when you were a kid, uh, your mom would say you could argue ice water out of the devil. So like that kind of like, you know, I, I kind of caught my attention. Um, and you write like a 10 page argument, like about why you should be able to do something if they said no. So like, tell us a little bit about that as a kid. Yeah. So apparently, um, you know, I was the kid that always got the talks too much in class or, um, you know, got in trouble because the teacher would say something. I'd be like, actually, um, (laughs) this, this, and this. So it was, it was interesting growing up because, you know, when my parents would say no to something, I, I of course had arguments as to why I should be able to do it. And so, you know, I have always been a writer And so apparently I would write 10, you know, 10 page single space letters as to why I should be able to do what I wanted to do and, you know, give it to my parents at night. And they would just be like, who is this person? Did you you get it overturned? Did they tell you, yes, you can? (laughs) Occasionally, you know, sometimes they pulled the, you know, uh, because I said so card, you know, (laughs) but sometimes I, sometimes I did end up getting my way. Gotcha. Okay. So, so you said you were a writer, obviously you were writing these like 10 page tomes to your parents and saying, Hey, this is why I should be able to do this. Like, what was it about journalism that you loved? Um, when you went on to college, you went to the university of Missouri, Columbia, one of the best, uh, or the best journalism school. Is that correct? Yes, absolutely. I actually, Oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say like, what was it about journalism that you loved? You know, I actually started in journalism, um, I believe in junior high or high school. I always loved writing. I always loved creative writing. And I think we had an assignment in like junior high where we were putting together like a a newspaper. Maybe it was about Black History Month or something to that effect. And I kind of took charge of that. And I just really liked the reporting aspect, talking to people synthesizing stories you know my whole thing is and and also why I love your podcast is because I'm a storyteller yeah and so you know I went on in high school and actually you know got involved with the school newspaper 
Okay. And ended up, you know, loving it and loving formal journalism. So really, n- yeah, didn't really realize it was like, you know, a career path until then. And I was like, oh, OK, journalism. That's cool. So, Tyra, did you have a moment when you were like, OK, well, I want to I want to go to law school? Like, what was that moment like? So I was in journalism school and at Missouri, um, you actually have to go in as pre-J. Okay, so you actually have to get accepted into the journalism school. And so you do your coursework your freshman and sophomore year. Um, One of the classes that you're required to take is communications law. And so that was, you know, talking about defamation and First Amendment and all of those things. And it was kind of that moment when I was like, oh, I think I want to protect journalists. I think I want to, you know, be the person who, you know, works with them on the legal side, because of course my parents had kind of been sprinkling the law school, law school, law school thing. Okay. All right. Got you. Um, And I thought that that would be a nice mix, you know, being able to, you know, work with journalists and, you know, still have my hand in that arena and then also be on the legal side. So it was kind of like my meeting point. Okay. And that must've been like a very interesting class in undergrad, right? Like the law, because I was a legal, so I was a legal studies major at UMass Amherst and like, it was kind of like sociology and the law. So I imagine Mm -hmm. this was like journalism and the law. So you're mixing this and you're seeing something sort of concrete. Like you get to see the law against journalism and learn all these like, and there's a lot of historical cases that have to do with you know, the defamation and, and um, you know, slander yes. and those sorts of things. So I could see how that would be very interesting. Absolutely. I mean, New York Times versus Sullivan, the, yeah, Vandenberg, was, all yeah. of those yep. ones. I was like, oh, I kind of like this. And then kind of in a whole full circle moment when I graduated from law school, I actually ended up teaching the, pretty much the same class um, at USC undergrad in their Annenberg School for Communication. So it was kind of a full circle thing. Okay, that's right. So where, wait, where were you teaching in, in the law school or undergrad? Undergrad for, undergrad. for journalism wow. and communication students okay. who were interested in law school, basically. That's amazing. So how did you get out to California? You went to, Cal- did you take any, well, first, did you take any time off between law school and undergrad? I didn't. I was okay. one of those people where I knew if I ended up taking time off, it was yes. going to be tough for me to start back. Yes. Um, I, yeah. So luckily, I mean, I had the ability to work in the field while I was in college and even some of the time when I was in law school and before law school in journalism. Um, and But I decided to just go straight through and quite frankly, the weather brought me to Southern California. Yeah, okay. So what, really? So you were just like, I want to go, how, well, how come not like Florida or something? You were just sort of like, I'm going to go out to California. That's, I yeah, mean, it's but, not like an unheard of thing. Like a lot of people no, go out absolutely. to California. But. So actually I was looking for, because I, I never, I guess, just do one thing. Um, so when I was an undergrad, I was actually a dual um, major in magazine journalism and also black studies Okay. and a minor in business because you know, why not? Right. Yeah. And so when I went, was looking at schools, I was looking for schools that had joint degrees with, uh, a master's in, you know, some sort of communication and law. And so that narrowed it down quite substantially to Columbia, Mizzou, Uh, USC, Berkeley, you know, there were maybe only a a couple of handfuls of schools that offered that type of joint degree program and just went out to USC and loved it. I think I probably went out in November or something or October and I was like, oh, it's like (laughs) warm here all the time. Yeah. And so that was a big selling point. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. So like, what was your law school experience like at USC? USC is interesting. Um, It's a really diverse law school. Uh, When I was there, I think there were something like 20, 25 Black students in my class, which was a really large number uh, in a class of 200. Um, And, you know, so there was a lot of racial, ethnic um, diversity, which I really liked. Um, My first year of law school, I, I was strictly law. Like I was not allowed to do my my communications right. masters until second and third year. So I, I honestly had, because I was doing a dual degree and trying to get it done in the same three years as law school, 
I probably had a more um, studious law school experience than than some, but it was definitely interesting being in Southern California. And it was the heyday of USC's football team being amazing. And and I love sports. So it was really okay. That's awesome. So like what, um, what advice would you give to a first year law student headed into law school? The advice I would give is, you know, try to strike a balance as much as possible. And I think that's probably what you know, all attorneys say now, you know, try to strike a balance. Yes, you're going to study a lot. Um, You know, it's inevitable, but, you know, try to find the little moments for fun. Try to make sure you take care of yourself, you know, go to the gym, do little things like that to, you know, keep yourself sane Yeah. uh, for the most part. And, and just remember, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. You're going to make it through. Right. And you, so you graduated in 08. Right. Yeah. So like, and you said, and, and there was a market crash, like a legal, legal job market crash. I was, I graduated actually a couple of years uh, earlier, but, um, and I sort of experienced a little bit of that too. So um, like, what was that like? Like, what was, what did you um, tell us about like your unconventional approach in 2008 when the, when the job market crashed? Yeah. So, I mean, I think everyone in my class, you know, went into law school with these big promises, right? Like, oh, you're going to come out, you're going to be making six figures. Don't yeah. worry about taking out those loans. Uh, I think everybody know. thinks that. I think like <laughs> non-lawyers especially right. are like, oh yeah, law school, six figures. I mean, they don't realize, you know, some of these jobs are not even close to that. You know, working, exactly. if you're working for like a solo practitioner or a small law firm, um, you know, because only a few people get those big dog jobs. Right. So, and at USC, it's that's kind of the expectation that a lot of people are going to get more of those big law jobs. And so, you know, we we came out, we went into law school thinking, oh, it's going to be great. Yeah, we'll do the government fixed loans for 8.5 percent. Yeah, sure. Um, and then the loans, the loans come in the loan day, the loans come in, everybody's going to get steak, you know, and they're, they're eating at the, you know, they go into the ground round for dinner and they're, you know, having a good time. And then it's like 10 years later, you're like, Oh, I got to pay these things back. But anyway, that's hindsight's 2020. Yeah. I'm trying to sound bitter, but, uh, (laughs) go go ahead. Continue Tyra. Of course not. Of course not. (laughs) And so, you know, 2007, I think the, the year I summered. Um, at a big firm, uh, I think the salary went up to something like for starting attorneys, I think it went up to 160. Wow, so yeah. we're all like, yeah, this is great. This is going to be great when we graduate. Yeah. And then at the beginning of 2008, it started crashing and it yeah. started tanking. Um, a lot of people who had offers lost offers. A lot of people, I think, didn't get offers that probably should have gotten offers because of that. And so you saw people, you know, it went from the height, you know, oh, it's going to be 160 coming out and you're going to be able to pay those loans off to, you know, basically, oh crap, you know, what are we going to do right. and how are we going to pay these loans off? So, so you think, summered, but did you get, did you get the offer or did that get revoked or what? I mean, I, you know, offers got revoked. They got yeah. revoked. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I think a lot of people had offers revoked. Um, and, and I mean, I was somebody who had a number of summer offers too. And so right. then you're like, should I go on to another firm? Like what's it? So everything oh. just started collapsing. Like we saw the slide happening in real time okay. and it was like a slow panic. Like, oh, oh this is not recovering. Yeah, I remember um, that. I do. I remember, I mean, not because of me. I mean, I wasn't like a big firm person, but I remember, you know, like reading about it, that sort of thing. So yeah, and and we're we're on above the law, and we're like, what is happening? What is happening? Yeah, yeah. Um, and so everybody started trying to figure out what they were going to do, and a lot of people who thought they were going to have big law jobs, you know, if they didn't pass the bar the first time, they, you know, they're panicking. Um, and so it literally ended up being where I was like, okay, I need to figure out something. I've got to reinvent myself because I have a ton of loans. I mean, I had scholarships and stuff to offset and I still had a ton of loans. Yeah. Um, and so I was like, I got to figure this out because USC level loans are, are not going anywhere anytime soon. And I actually uh, ended up going in-house 
for a small service-based business, nothing to do with the creative industry at all. Right. Um, I was what were, only, sorry. What were you doing? Like when you were summering, like, were you doing things that you wanted to do? Like what kind of uh, law were you? I, when I was summary, a lot of memos, um, yeah. a lot of, um, you know, research, things well, of that What was the topic? What was the practice? General it? business law, okay. some intellectual property okay. and entertainment. All right. So, so you were on the right path to like what you wanted to do. Exactly. I did get a little bit of it. Um, so I had, I had the fortune I, of, of getting a, um, a position where I was basically general counsel straight out of law school for this small service-based business. Well, they were probably pumped, you know, they were like general counsel, you know, like they were probably- and I'm like general counsel. They were probably <laughs> super pumped, you know? Yeah, so, yeah. exactly. And, and the nice thing was I was able to have my practice and start kind of doing a few clients here and there and entertainment on the side. Okay. Um, so I was still able to keep a pulse with, um, you know, what was going on in, in the industry a bit. But it was really a trial by fire. I actually, had you know, no that, idea what I was doing. That so I actually have that note when you said trial by fire. But I do want to ask you something that kind of I think of as we talk. So like, is it possible to like work somewhere and practice law on the side? Do you think? I think I think it depends. I I do know a number of people who are able to do it. Um, I was because they were based in Illinois, which is where I'm from, from Chicago land. And uh, I was out in LA, you know, they didn't care if I handled, you know, entertainment clients on the side because, you know, I was basically representing them in business contracts, you know, everything from, you know, because they had physical locations, slip and falls, um, <laughs> all sorts yeah. of stuff that I had no idea what I was doing ever. So, so, <laughs> so you, so so you could you're you're saying like you can handle things on the side, but I think it's as long as you don't have to go to court, you know, and like during the day when you're at your, like your your job, your full time job, like stuff that you could do at night, maybe that's like transactional. Would you say that's accurate? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, I was doing all transactional. I was not doing any litigation at that point, except for dealing with outside counsel um, with respect to um, you know the my day job, the actual business. right. So right. They had outside counsel that would handle any litigation. Also, if there was something, you know, that was like covered by insurance and insurance would have counsel. So I was dealing with them. Okay. Uh, but I, I, on the, on my side, I was doing really strictly transactional at that point. And you did, you mentioned before, and I actually have it in my notes. You said the job was trial by fire. So like that was your first law job. And I feel like, you know, because we in law school don't have like what, you know, doctors had like go you know, do this for a year, go do the hands-on. So they're like, they're throwing you in. Obviously they had a lot of faith in you. You know, you're coming from like a big <laughs> law sort of background, some experience there, wonder about great law school. So they're like, we trust Tyra. Like she, we're going to throw her in and let her handle it. But like, tell us what trial by fire means to you. I mean, as you know, law school doesn't really teach you how to be a lawyer. Right. right? Um, and I think going from law school, I did work during my third year um, at a smaller firm, but it was still in, in, in that capacity, I actually was drafting like motions and whatnot. So I knew a little bit, but I mean, if I had to file something, I didn't know what I was doing. Um, yeah. So I spent a lot of time learning how to be a lawyer okay. while on the job. Um, okay. Luckily they had outside counsel that you know would make sure I didn't totally screw up something um, right. <laughs> but you know it was a lot of research it was a lot of google it was a lot of ordering books and trying to learn about contracts and based in watching CLEs and basically teaching myself you know the practice of law especially since it was in an area that I wasn't as familiar with I mean most right. of my you know law school track was more geared towards the entertainment side of things so I was literally the only attorney, you know, within the company structure. So. Wow. Was okay. And how long did you stay there? And then did you start um, Hughley Smith Law right after that? Or did you go to another job? You know, I actually was there. Hmm, was it 10 years? Seven years, seven, seven years. Yeah. eight years or so. Wow. Okay. Uh, I was, I was at that company 
And, you know, still, if they call me about something periodically, you know, I handle it for them. So now they're kind of a client. Okay. Um, but, you know, until they, I, they kind of slowly divested things. So, yeah. So for years I was, I was with them. I, and then I kind of took the approach of just trying to build up my practice a little bit slowly, but surely while I was working for them. But as I'm sure you can appreciate, it's hard to do when you're working a full-time job sure, uh, yeah. elsewhere. So, you know, I had a couple of clients on the side, um, but I actually went to a CLE, a mediation training and met my next boss um, who actually runs, uh, ran the photo attorney law firm. So it was a law firm geared towards copyrights and, and photographers. Wow. I just happened to sit next to her at mediation training. We hit it off and she offered me a job. Wow, that's amazing. Okay. So yeah. that was like your second job at all. Yeah, that was okay. that was kind of my second job with, you know, sprinklings of litigation support in there for, you know, small firms and whatnot throughout that time. So this was my second official job. So how long were you there? And like, was that a good experience for you? It was an amazing experience. It was my first, um, well, I've always actually been remote, right? So I, I mean, the company okay. was based in Illinois. I would go back and forth periodically, but I was based in LA. Um, and so you know, the photo attorney was actually a virtual law firm. So they had somebody in San Diego. Um, the main partner was in Reno, someone in Atlanta. So they had people all over. So that was kind of my first experience with a virtual law firm. And I was like, oh, no, this, this actually works. This is, <laughs> yeah. this is pretty cool. I like this. Yeah. No, that's awesome. Um, so like what, and at what point were you able to launch your firm? Just, and that was it. So while I was at, while I was there, I actually was promoted, I guess, to a junior partner. Um, and then, you know, a couple of years later, the main partner decided to semi-retire. And because she was semi-retiring, she, you know, kind of shut down the firm, if you will, or slowly started shutting down the firm. So I was like, okay, well, I guess this is it. Uh, welcome yeah. to Lee Smith Law. <laughs> and so there you go. Wow, that's not yeah. a bad deal, huh? Okay. Yeah. So you, as she went, as she wound down her practice, you took over some of the existing clients who already exactly. had a rapport with you. Ex okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so what would you beginning. say? What's your advice to an entrepreneur who's trying to uh, launch their own firm? Like, what would you say? I didn't realize because I, I kind of launched my own firm uh, in twenty. 16, I think it was, and didn't really realize the emphasis that I see now on systems. Systems. Um, okay. having, sy having systems in place is key because I'm kind of on the back end of that, right? You know, I right. kind of have my firm more set up in a traditional way. Um, and I think having systems in place to help you and automate things as much as possible uh, is key because I think, I think we un underestimate how much time you spend doing administrative stuff. I love that. Trying to um, run a law firm. And I, you know, I've been learning actually that a lot um, through some podcasts, like delegate, delegate, delegate. Like a lot of attorneys, like, you know, want to focus on, help you focus on like what's um, most important, what you like doing the best and then take everything else and like kind of right. dish it out, you know? Um, so tell us more about that. Like, actually, I'm, I'm curious, like, what system maybe was not in place prior? And I'm not, it's not like um, anything negative against your old boss. Obviously she was terrific, but what did you implement? What kind of a system um, for maybe, you know, payment systems or like client intake or something that helped you? You know, I think the biggest one for me, and it's something that I just implemented in the last year and a half or so is intake and, and emails. Like I realized, and, and this is also partly because I think, you know, my old boss, we weren't practicing in this area. So like for trademarks, for example, there are certain emails every single client's going to get as their trademark goes through the process. Okay. And I found myself retyping those emails all the time. I was like, why am I doing this? Like, why okay. do I not just have a system to automate these emails that I can click a button <laughs> Right. And, and that's one of the big emphasis in, you know, some of the legal communities that I'm a part of is 
automating things, you know, having certain things trigger. Somebody signs the contract and it triggers this and it triggers that. Right. Like, so I'm not spending as much time on the admin side of things. And I think that's been the biggest time saver and helper for me, um, you know, trying to run a practice and also practice law. I think that's like great advice or great. That's uh, something that's really helps you with efficiency. And it's awesome that you pick, like you were able to pick up on that. And uh, so, th so I think actually this sort of connects with it because you use the phrase, I handle the legal um, so my clients can operate in their zones of genius. So for another client who might have legal stuff that they're, who isn't a lawyer, who's trying to uh, navigate it, they dish that off to you so they could operate, you know, sort of just like what you do in a way, right? Absolutely. Sort of like reverse, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and look, I, I'm a big proponent of paying people to do what they're good at. Yeah. Like I could maybe sit and try to figure out TurboTax and figure out my taxes, but why? That's what an accountant's for, right? right. Um, so I believe in taking the legal stuff off my client's plates so that they can focus on what they're good at and what yep. they like doing, right? Because right. they didn't go to law school for a reason. They don't want to be a lawyer, right? And I enjoy the legal side of things, but I don't enjoy the tech support side of things. I don't enjoy, you know, the, um, you know, administrative, you know, stuff and, and all of that and keeping up with that. So I'm, you know, trying to build a team to help me so that I can actually practice and do what I love doing too. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And I definitely have spoken to a couple of people along the way, like to book in the podcast. So I could tell you have your systems uh, <laughs> under control and they've done a wonderful job. So that's uh, props to you, as they say. Thank you. <laughs> I feel like I'm behind the curve. I mean, there are some people who have this thing yeah. so automated and I'm just like teach me your ways sensei uh, actually like well I have somebody in mind that I can uh, I want to connect you with who who I had absolutely. a whole podcast about it like who does he had he runs like this whole thing with funnels and I definitely want to connect him with you because Please. he talks about this and you could tell him you met you know you we uh you know had a podcast together but um yeah that's that's terrific and by the way when you are on lawyer stores if you're ever just scrolling there for fun if you ever see somebody that you want to connect with and you want me to do the introduction, let me know. I'd, I'd be happy to do that. That's what we do here. I like to connect lawyers, Absolutely. lawyers, law students, and lawyers. Yeah, for sure. Um, it's a very nice community. So I hope you'll, I definitely hope you'll, you know, be active in it. Um, so tell us about, um, I always want to say, I'm always making sure I say the last name with the with the G the, the uh. so tell us about uh, Hughley Smith Law um, and does being a serial entrepreneur like you are um, does that how does that help serve your clients? Oh, they know I get it, right? I mean, I think you know I have travel businesses um, <laughs> which are at a complete standstill because of COVID. Right, um, right. Actually, yeah, that's actually my next, uh, one of my next questions, but go ahead. And then I also have um, uh, the legal pad, which is a contract template and education yes. shop where I have workshops, you know, contract templates, resources for entrepreneurs. And so obviously for the people who may not feel like they have a full legal budget, okay. um, you know, they can go to the, you know, the legal pad, they know that the contracts there have been drafted by an attorney. They're not just finding something randomly on Google. You know, I actually take time to draft different versions of contracts. So like, for example, I work with a lot of bloggers and influencers. Mm -hmm. Well, I know, and also having my own travel blog that, you know, you having an agreement that's pro influencer is way different. You know, I want to see an agreement that's way different than the brand may want to see. So I have different versions of contracts too, so that people can really choose and what's going to help their business and be tailored to them until they feel like they have a full legal budget. So I think that's one way that it helps. And that's like I, a subscription too. They can go on there and pull it yeah. for a yearly cost. I saw. Yeah. Okay. And get access yeah. to everything that's, that's in great. there. Do they have, then they have to like just tweak it, like obviously. like And, right, and they just tweak it. There's highlights, there's notes yeah. in the margins. And so I think that that's something that's, that's really. Who do, do they offer, do you offer answers to any questions they have? Or what? 
Yeah. And every so often we'll do Q and A sessions. We'll do, you know, if they have questions and just want to book a quick call with me, um, I do that as well. So that is definitely one way, but I think just on a more fundamental level, you know, being a serial entrepreneur, my clients know that I get it right. You know, like I have other businesses I'm trying to balance. I'm trying to you know, exercise self-care. I'm trying to balance multiple businesses and figure out where startup money is going to come from for one and why I feel like I've worked and have no money all year because I'm dumping it into another business. So I get it on just a fundamental level what it is to start up multiple businesses. So like what may, what would you say makes a serial entrepreneur? A little bit of ADD and... <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, I think somebody who's multi-interested, I think that everybody now wants to be a serial entrepreneur. Like everyone's heard yeah. that, oh, you should have seven streams of income. Right. Um, and so while, I sitting on, I, while sitting on the beach and, you know, it'll just, just come in and hit your right. bank account every couple of weeks. Right, exactly. And so I think that it's, it's a buzz type of thing mm-hmm. right now, but I think it really does take a special type of person to be able to do it. I also don't think you can do it yourself. I mean, I, this is one of the things I'm learning to relinquish some control um, because Oprah wasn't built in a day and she wasn't built by herself. Um, So, you know, she's got teams for her multiple enterprises. And I think being able to build up people that you trust and people, you know, who have your best interests at heart around you is key. Right. Yep. Totally. Um, so like, where do you see your firm in five to 10 years? That's a great question. Um, I see myself working less, honestly. Uh, I see myself in more of a, you know, kind of an overseeing role. I, I don't think I would ever not want to practice, right? I like having my hands in it, but I love the strategy aspect and working with my clients in the vision of things. So, you know, I think that that's probably more of the approach that I would take. Um, I have a couple of other attorneys that I'm working with now. uh, And so bringing them on in more of a uh, full-time capacity to be able to handle some of the day-to-day legal so that I can focus on, you know, the strategy for clients and the business protection and kind of seeing the pitfalls and helping them, you know, navigate them. Because for a number of my clients, I'm kind of outside general counsel, if you will. So taking on more of that role than the everyday, you know, drafting the contracts role. And what, so the, what would you say, like the, the, the crux, is that the word I'm looking for of, (laughs) of your practice is like working with small businesses, doing their um, IT and, or I'm sorry, IP rather, and um, trademarks, that's just everything business, right? All business. Yeah, I think so. I think it's really a business and brand protection and strategy. So brand protection a strategy. lot of that is, you know, intellectual property, you know, protecting your trademarks and protecting your copyrights, you know, because for a lot of small business owners, your intellectual property is your business's biggest asset, right? Okay. You yep. know, you're creating that course, you're you know, right, doing your podcast, right? The IP is is kind of the biggest asset of the business. So, right. you know, protecting that, but then also the strategy, making sure that, you know, these people aren't, you know, out here working with Tom, Dick, and Harry and have no contracts in place or, you know, have no, nothing in, in place to protect themselves. So it's kind of twofold. It's the, the strategy side of things and the vision, Um, and working with them on the vision because I can often see vision for clients better than I can see it for myself. Really? Okay. That's, that's interesting. Uh, All right. And then working on the protection side of things and making sure that they are protecting their businesses, because what's the point of building a seven, eight figure business if you're not going to protect it? You're not going to. Yeah, no, for sure. So, so like going back to your blog, what kind of things do you like to write about? And like, where do you like to travel and take pictures? Oh man. Um, so I actually started the travel blog because I missed writing. I missed journalism. Um, I missed storytelling. And so I started the travel blog, which is 
been pretty defunct. The law firm has been taking up a lot of my time during COVID, in all honesty. Um, but I still love traveling. I actually just got back from Jordan a couple of weeks ago. Oh, okay. Uh, which was amazing, but really interesting. Uh, I got in and out before, you know, kind of the shutdown started happening, but uh -huh. definitely traveling during COVID is a different beast than it yeah. was previously. Yeah, for sure. And, and by the way, like we have a website, the lawyerstories.com. And we'd love to post some of your blog posts um, if, awesome. you, if you would like to do that. I, you can Absolutely. Email with a photo of yourself, the blog post, and then, you know, a title. We'd love, I'd send, I'll send it to uh, uh, somebody who works on my team and we'll get it up on the website. Awesome. We'd I love appreciate to do that. that. Yeah, for sure. Send that. us a few of them if you want. Yeah, um, absolutely. So it's the lawyerstories.com. So um, I think we asked a couple questions, but what we asked about like the law school, we asked about the entrepreneurs, but what are your, what's your advice for young lawyers? Ooh. So I have people ask me all the time, should I go to law school? So I guess this is advice for people who haven't even gotten to the lawyer sure. phase of thing. Um, and, and the first thing I would say is make sure it's something you really want to do. Yeah. I think a lot of people are like, I don't know what to do. So I'll go to law school. Yeah. And that's a really oh. expensive, um, uh, endeavor to take on, you know, know that you're going to be paying off loans for, you know, possibly the better part of 30 years. Um, so really, I think, try your hardest to go somewhere that makes sense financially. Um, and honestly, I would just say, break out of some of the traditional ideas of lawyers, right? I mean, like I run a virtual practice. I know a number of people who run virtual practices. I think a lot of law firms, including big law firms, um, recognize, oh, do we really need all this office space? Do we really, do people really need FaceTime as much as we thought right, they did? Right, right. And I think it's shaking up the legal industry this last year and a half. So I think it's, you know, make it what you want it to be, you know, make it, you know, your own and that's all you can do um you know make sure you learn your craft i also see you know unfortunately uh, you know because it is such a online community now and you know there's so many lawyers groups and you can go and ask for advice a lot of times i think uh, young attorneys focus more on the fame being instagram famous if you will or you know and crowdsourcing their legal education and it's like don't take that shortcut okay yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, make sure you know your stuff because if i see that you're just trying like i mentor younger attorneys i work with i co-counsel with other attorneys but if i see that you are just crowdsourcing your legal education and you're not putting the work that's not going to make me want to work with you um, and I when you say crowdsourcing, what do you mean by crowdsourcing? Like I'll see, you know, attorney groups on Facebook where people are like, oh, you know, how do I do this, this, and this? And it's not just like the, the process of being a lawyer. It's like, oh, what do I need to file? And what do I need to argue? And it's like, okay. learn, learn your craft, you know, like yeah, there's learn. nothing, there's nothing that's going to get you around that. Okay. You know, know your stuff, but you can take a more unconventional approach. It doesn't have to be big law to in-house to, you know, and that's a perfectly viable approach if that's what you want to do. I've now realized that I'm probably unemployable. <laughs> um, I don't know that I would be able to go and work for somebody just full time because I like my freedom. And I think yeah. that, you know, a yeah. lot of people are realizing, you know, there, there's things that are more important than just going to an office every day you know, drilling out work and then going home and doing the same thing the next day. Yeah, no, totally. Um, so, wow, that's like some great advice in there. Um, so Tyra Hughley Smith, did, did I leave anything out today? No, I think that's it. Really? That's it. Do you have anything else to say to the lawyer stories community? No, I'm just so thankful and happy to be able to be on here. And oh, please. I, you know, I've definitely um, seen a number of your podcasts. So I, I'm just, humbled to be in good company. Really? Well, thank you. Uh, yeah. And I think that it's great. I think that having these communities where we can, uh, you know, talk about the issues, talk about things that we have learned along the way and, you know, things we're still learning and help 
a younger generation of attorneys is, is really key. I mean, I've been practicing for 13, 14 years now, and you know, there's a lot that I'm learning even from newer attorneys, um, sure, sure. you know, especially on the tech side of things. So I think that there's yeah. always room to grow and always glad to be able to, you know, share a few of the things that I've learned along the way. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. And stay right there. I have a couple things I want to follow up with you, but uh, okay. thanks for tuning in. I, I really appreciate uh, you, Tara, for uh, chatting with us. That was some great info and insight. Um, you know, wishing you the best of success for 2022. And I hope, you know, this, uh, this leads us into the launch of, you know, hopefully uh, staying in touch. And uh, so everybody else, wherever you are in the world today, enjoy yourselves. Cheers.